Well, hi, Nick here, M0NTV, and welcome back to my shack and to another homebrew video. In fact, part two of our little mini series on the multifunction digital VFO. Last time we looked at the hardware, this time we're checking out the software. But before we launch into that, there's two important things that I've got to say. The first thing is, I'm no more an expert at the software <laughs> than I am at the hardware, right? Okay, so and so if you are, if you've got a big background in coding and, and, and whatever, um, you know, you might look at the code and think, well, this is not very good, I can do better than this, and what's he done, that, you know. All I can say is, it works for me. It may not be the best way of doing it, it may not be the most optimised way of doing it, but it works for me. So um, you'll have to just bear that in mind. Uh, and if you can tinker it and get it better, then go for it, you know? The second thing, and this is the most important thing I've got to say, is this. It's a, it's a dangerous thing doing a video like this and giving away your code. Because when I do these videos normally, and I'm talking about hardware, so it's, I don't know, a filter or something. So I'll build a filter and, and I'll show you how I build it. And, and maybe you'll go away and you'll build the filter. But I think there's an expectation with hardware that what I build is not going to be identical to what you end up building. Because you'll have different components from different sources. You might build it in a different way. And uh, so whilst you're looking for it to be broadly, you know, the same, you, there's not an expectation it's going to be identical. However, with software, I think the expectations are way higher because actually, what I, you know, there's a download link in the, in the description to this video. So you can have the precise code that runs on my Arduino here that runs my VFO. And, and so... You know, you might download it. I've linked to the libraries that, that I use and the version of the libraries that, that, that I use uh, in the description as well, so you can do all that. Um, but there's, there's kind of a, a greater expectation with some people that, that you know, they'll, they'll download it and, and, and whatever, and, and it'll work first time. And <laughs> it might, <laughs> you know, you might be really... It might not. And there's a, there's a whole bunch of reasons why that may not be the case. Your hardware may be different to mine and I, I, on the last video when I covered the hardware um, I actually put in the description there the precise hardware that I used so you might want to go and check that out again. Um, you might have wired it up differently, you might have used different pins on the Arduino uh, that, that I did. Um, you might have the wrong libraries installed or you might have the right libraries but a different version of the library than I've used. Any of these things could break the code right, and would prevent it from uh, either compiling or, or working in the way that you, you intended it to work. So you need to hear this, folks. With the best will in the world, you know, I'm, I'm giving this code out for free. You know, take it, use it with my blessing and, and knock yourselves out with it. But... I personally can't provide any software support. So please do not send me messages, emails, comments saying, I tried your 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 code and I couldn't get it to work. You know, what's wrong with it? You know, um, because I, I'm not going to answer them, right? <laughs> I just do not have the time for, for that. Um, and if that fills you with fear and dread, then that's probably a good sign that this is not the project that you should be undertaking right now because you need to be confident enough, first of all, in your abilities to, to wire all this stuff up. And there's a lot of stuff to wire up in this. You know, if you saw the last video, this is not, not trivial and it's not simple. But secondly, you need to be confident enough in handling the software side of things. So, I mean, I'm using the Arduino uh, IDE. You need to know about installing libraries and, and, and what to do if things are not working quite the, 
the, the same way because there's a number of things and I've just mentioned a few there um, that, that are common kind of problems. So with those two caveats, um, yeah, we're going to have a look at the code and uh, and and if you want to have a go, I'm not going to be there holding your hand, but if you want to have a go and and do your best with it, then that's fantastic. I've tried to comment it as much as possible so you can see what's going on. And we're going to have a look now at the bits that you're going to have to tweak within this code to try and get it to work for you. And um, <laughs> may God be with you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, with a fair wind, you know, um, hopefully, uh, if you're going to give this a stab, you, you might get to, uh, something working. Um, so, uh, First of all, we're just going to take a small detour and just a quick update on a bit of the hardware that I talked about last time and I've now done. And then we're going to have a, a little uh, sprint through uh, uh, the code and, uh, and see what it does. So I hope you find this of interest. So I did what I think I uh, said I was going to do in the last video, which was to filter the tuning tone which you will remember is a um, five volt square wave coming off the Arduino pin. And you, you can see here, I built a very simple, it's a six pole RC low pass audio filter. And uh, so that will convert our square wave into, well, certainly not a pure sine wave, but something a lot more sinusoidal um, uh, than a square wave. And, um, sounds a lot better and uh, is obviously because it's it's going through these series resistors is, is uh, attenuated a lot so it's a smaller signal which is what I want to go into the microphone amplifier and with less harmonics as well um, so uh, that's good and I'll just show you a quick um, just schematic on that but it's, it's uh, very simple uh, but seems to do uh, do the trick but other than that it is as you saw it um uh, last time so here is my very simple little six pole audio rc filter and you'll see it's just the same values 10k resistors and 4.7 nano farad capacitors and uh, just to show you what that looks like so uh, this um yeah that's what it looks like with no filtering Okay, so after one stage, after two stages, three stages, four, five, and finally six. So this is the latest one here. So you can see every uh, stage of filtering gives us a sharper um, attenuation then, um, and uh, which is what we want, and just, for interest's sake, so you can see what it looks like in the time domain. Um, bit of a mess. No, <laughs> we'll start off with this. Let's just take a little bit of this. Um, so that's our five volt square wave coming from the Arduino in our case. Um, I'm just going to see how our filter affects it. So after one stage, get that, and then that, and you can see what's happening with every stage. We're attenuating it, and we're just making it a little bit more sinusoidal and a little bit less square. So the final one is that, and um, yeah, so um, certainly not a sine wave, but um, looking more like a, a sign than a square so uh, so I think that'll do nicely so here is my code and uh, if it looks familiar if you've uh, seen the video that I made or the series of videos that I made when I was building the shelf 17 uh, actually that code for that digital VFO, which was much simpler than this one, uh, is based on the same code. Now I say my code, um, but I draw your attention to these um, uh, words at the beginning here. I owe a great 
debt of gratitude, as do we all, uh, to Jason Mildrum, uh, NT7S, uh, for his groundbreaking work on the uh, the SI5351 and, and helping us to use that simply and easily with um, things like Arduinos. But also um, uh, uh, Prismanek uh, Sadowski and Tommy Hall as well, who've adapted this code and made it what it is. Uh, and I've taken all their work um, and uh, and kind of adapted it myself. Uh, there's probably other bits that I've pinched from other people as well, and so I do apologise if you see something and you think, hang on a minute, that's my code. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I've tried to credit people when where I could remember where I'd got things from. Now, this code, um, which I'm making available, and I will link to it below uh, in the description, you couldn't just upload this to your own Arduino and expect it to work the same. It will need tweaking depending on precisely what you build yourself. And actually there are five points in this code and I'll show you where they are where you will have to edit with your own values. Um, but And this is going to be a fairly high level kind of walk through this code because otherwise it's going to get a bit tedious. Um, but uh, it, here we go. So um, basically I'm just setting all the necessary libraries, uh, the pins for the rotary encoder, some colours just to save me writing hexadecimal codes or anything down there as well, um, the TFT screen pin definitions as well which, which are there. Now this is the first point that you're going to have to um, tweak if you live outside of the UK because obviously this rig I'm building is for 15 meters and for 10 meters and what I've done is I've put in the code uh, some kind of limiting so that you can't tune out of band uh, but of course bands are different depending on where you live in the world so so I've put in obviously the UK uh, allocation there and uh, uh, so you would have to change here. You, you only need to do the change once at this point because the rest of the code just uses these um, uh, these kind of fixed parameters. So, um, but you can do that. So that that's the first thing. And if you live in the UK, you can leave it as it is. And so now this is the. So that's the first bit you need. To, the second bit, and this is the most important bit, and this is going to take a little bit of explaining. You need to set up the VFO and the BFO. And and I'll show you what I mean by this in a minute. But, but first of all, when you look at these, and this confused me for a while, um, these horrifically long numbers that seem far too big now this ULL is unsigned long long. This is a huge variable. Um, and if you think, well, if that's meant to be a frequency, it's way too big. In fact, it's a hundred times too big. Well, it is. And you'll see that all these ULL variables are have got a couple of extra zeros on. They're all a hundred times too big. Now the reason for that as Jason Mildrum explains in the README uh, in, the, in his uh, Etherkit uh, library documentation, is that actually the SI5351 calculates frequency to 0 0.01 hertz, so a hundredth of a hertz, which is <laughs> not much use to us, really. So, consequently, in his... Uh, header file in his library he's got um, uh, this this thing called SI5351 frequency multiplier which you can just drop in basically all that does it, it just it just stands for 100 so um, what you do is you take this big long number here and divide it by 100 to get the, the figure in Hertz and uh, so yeah so, but but it needs to have it in that format, the, so the SI fifty three fifty one can can work with it. Um, so you just that's yeah that's it, it's all there, but it's it's one of those things that it just kind of looks a bit strange until you kind of get your head round it. Now, 
what are these? Well, there's a lower sideband setting and an upper sideband setting. This basically is, we're talking about the IF frequency here and, and, and what the BFO frequency will be to convert that down to, to baseband. Now, this is going to depend on your crystal filter. And as you can see here, I, I, I base this on an eight pole uh, crystal filter that I home brewed, which is sat at 13.3 megahertz or thereabouts, 2.7 kilohertz. Now, what you have to do here, if you're using USB, as, as I am, because I'm doing it for 15 meters and 10 meters, is this figure here, you don't need to worry about the LSB because we're not going to be using it, but this figure here is actually the top edge of your crystal sideband filter plus an optional 300 hertz to uh, attenuate some of the lower frequencies and allow some of the higher frequencies through the passband. Now when I say the top edge of your crystal sideband filter, now for me that is the minus 6 dB point of your crystal filter. Some people measure crystal filters with minus 3 dB. I and some others do it minus 6, and so that's how I'm measuring it. And your passband is, is in between that, the, the, the top minus 6 dB and the bottom minus 6 dB. Whatever's in between is your passband. So, it, and in my case, it's 2.7 kilohertz. So what you can do is you can actually move this figure, which will give you a bit of movement as to how your signal goes through the filter. Now, let me show you what that looks like, because, you know, a picture paints um, a, a thousand words. So it's very important to set up the the VFO so that your signal is passing correctly through your crystal filter and uh, and that's the the great thing about a digital VFO it's it's pretty easy to to do that so uh, here we go then so let's imagine we're on receive and we've got our first mixer and just to keep the maths easy let's have a three kilohertz wide signal sitting right at the top end of the UK allocation of 15 metres in the last 3 kilohertz, 347 to 350. And let's say we've got our local oscillator running at uh, 34.676 megahertz. What that will give us is the sum, which gives us a 3 kilohertz wide signal sitting just north of the six meter band and the difference which is the one we're interested in the rf minus the local oscillator which gives us um minus 329 to minus 326 uh, megahertz so what that means is this so here's our at the rf stage there's our signal okay so it's an upper sideband signal sat between 21347 and 21350. And note the orientation of it. So this, this bit, the wide bit or tall bit, I should say, corresponds to the higher frequencies of the modulated audio signal. Right? And these are the lower frequencies. And in other words, it's a correctly orientated signal. Right? And... Um, but what happens is, is when we mix it down, so this is the IF stage, what we get, and this is what this minus tells us, very important, is that there is an inversion going on. So what we get is that. So it's the same signal, but now it's inverted, so effectively it's lower sideband. So all the higher audio frequencies of the modulated audio are down the bottom end and the lower frequencies at the top end, so it's the wrong way round. That's not a problem because when we feed it through the second mixer, which will be the product detector, it will invert it again and it will be the right way round. But the reason I show you this is, of course, it's at the IF stage that we have to filter. Right? So there's our crystal filter, let's say. Now you'll see... The crystal filter will be 
uh, of of whatever bandwidth you build it, but generally speaking, it'll be smaller than your signal, um, and you'll have to decide which bits of the signal you want to go through. So you can see here at the moment we're getting pretty much all the lower frequencies going through, but we're missing out quite a few of the higher frequencies just because of where the filters sat. Now we can't do much about the filter because it is, you know, as you build it. But what we can do is effectively shift everything else around it, which will give the appearance of moving the filter up and down. We're not really moving the filter, we're just moving everything else. Um, so what we can do, of course, is we can alter this local oscillator figure and uh, and when it comes to the um, the product detector, it'll be the the, the BFO. Um, we can alter that um, uh, up or down slightly to actually help us. And so what I'm suggesting on on when I showed you the code was to take the top end um, of the of the filter and uh, and actually to to add 300 uh, uh, to it to actually shift this this whole frequency up higher into the filter so it will look like this watch carefully okay right so what we've done we've not moved the filter the move the filter is still the same what we've done is we've shifted the actual local oscillator figure which has, has shifted where the the signal is now lying so now you'll see we're getting pretty much all of the high frequency content of that signal and we're attenuating the bottom lower frequencies which is probably what we want to do anyway so that essentially is what we are doing in the software so you might need to play around with this uh, figure a little bit um, to, to tweak it up and down so that um, when you're receiving uh, the the audio sounds right you've got the the right kind of balance of, of highs and lows and mids um, and also when you're transmitting to make sure that you you know you, you don't sound too tinny um, uh, but but you don't really too bassy either so um yeah it's a bit of um uh, kind of um uh, try it and, um, and and see how you get on so that's probably the most important thing uh, to tweak. And you'll notice this value here, this BFO, is just the same as this. So you've got one for LSB and one for USB. And uh, and then you, you set the BFO um, according to which one you're, you're using. And, uh, and actually, you, you can change from um, LSB to USB, and, and, and that's fine. But these are just initial settings um, that, that we're putting in here. So let's have a little look then. Uh, okay, second, uh, that's the second. <laughs> Third really important thing, mode of operation. Th this is really cool. I kept this in. I'm not sure if this is actually Jason's or Tommy Hall's or, or whoever it is, but it's, it's very, very good. There's three different modes that you can operate this software in. We're using the IF offset one, which is what you'd use for a superhead. But you could comment that out and uncomment one of these others and use it in two other ways. Direct conversion, I've done that many times. So that's basically, that ignores all this stuff about, you know, um, offsets and going through crystal filters. And it's just literally what you see is what you get. So if you've got 7.1 megahertz on the screen, that's what's coming out of your SI5351. And for a direct conversion receiver, that's brilliant. Um, or, uh, and I've used this before on one occasion as well, if you're building some kind of uh, phasing rig, and I was building a, a phasing SDR transceiver, whereas I, I needed um, an I and a Q signal, so you've got to kind of um, uh, shift the phase of one of those signals, very often what you do is you produce... Uh, a, a signal which is four times higher than you want it because then you're going to run it through two uh, uh, well you run it through a divide by two um, circuit twice so you get the the, the appropriate phase shift um, but to do that you need 
you need to start with a signal that's four times as big as you need it. And so you can do that if you want. That's the times four. But um, that's just for information. I left it in there just because it makes yeah, the code really useful. Okay. So let's find the setup. Okay. So um, first of all, uh, we initialize some stuff here. We run the splash screen. So that's that little um, process here, uh, which... Uh, basically just put your call sign up there and says what version of the firmware it is, etc, etc. Uh, and you can disable that if you, if you want, or, or you can display it for less time. That's entirely up to you. Um, then we, uh, we do some initialization. We draw some of the stuff on the TFT screen, uh, some of the uh, borders and, and and shapes that we're going to use and then we uh, need to initialize uh, a whole load of pins um, and I've tried to, to detail these here I'm not going to go through all, all of these um, but uh, essentially uh, the ones I would draw your attention to uh, particularly uh, is, is this what I call TX group 1 and TX group 2 these are the groups of of modules and relays that are going to be switched on or off on transmit and receive and we'll see those um, in, in just a moment right um, so uh, th so the first thing was the UK band allocation limit you, you've got to change second thing you need to edit is setting up the VFO BFO uh, thirdly I said was the mode of operation you can probably just keep that as it is as long as it's set to the offset one uh, here we go. Now, there's two. The last two things you need to edit relate directly to the SI5351. One of them is this figure here. It's called the calibration factor, and you will need to run Jason Mildred's calibration sketch, uh, which basically all it does is, is it gets the SI5351 to, to output a, a 10 megahertz tone. And you you tune it in as as best you can by by using various uh, uh, keys on your on your keypad, and you end up with a with a, a number, and that's that number there that you you enter in. Um, I've done this. I've got a video about this where I go into details and show you exactly how to how to do that. I think it was on the last VFO video that I did when I was doing the shelf seventeen. So look that up. And that goes into all the details about precisely how you can do that. But you will need that number. And they're all different. So if you put mine in, you know, it, it won't work. You'll, you'll need to, to measure what your own is. And, uh, and then you'll be bang on frequency. And fifthly, and finally, the last bit you'll need to edit is the drive strength of the SI5351. And obviously there are three ports we're not using. Um, port one. Now, if you're using an active mixer chip like a Gilbert cell, something like an NE602612, then you will need a low drive like the, the two milliamp setting. You can set it to two, four, six, or eight milliamps measured into a 50 ohm load. I've got mine set to four uh, at the moment. Generally, what I do is I will probably set them higher than I need and then I will pad down the local oscillator port of the mixer with um, a pi attenuator which will give me the right drive level and also will help you know with a better 50 ohms um, termination on the on the mixer port as well so that's and again you can't really set that I mean you can set it but but you might need to tweak it when you've built your your mixer and your your uh, product detector balance modulator. That's the only stuff really you need to tweak to get it to to work. Um, but I'll just step you through some of the other things so you can see kind of what's going on. Um, yeah, some of these things relate to the different uh, modes of operation. Um, so here's the loop. So this is the main thing. So the first thing, most important thing, is we are going to determine whether we are transmitting or receiving. And that will be 
determined by if pin 12 is is grounded because if pin 12 is grounded that means the ptt has been pressed and that means we're in transmit mode so we call the transmit function and uh otherwise we uh we we call the receive function i think probably been calling them processes i'm over <laughs> the problem of <laughs> too many different languages over too many years really but functions <laughs> we are in c plus plus aren't we right um so let's have a little look at those here we are here we are so when we call transmit things that need to happen in transmit mode so there's uh, a question about whether you the tuning tone flags on whether you show the tuning tone indicator or not um the main business is here we've got these two groups you remember i said about group one and group two and they're they're tied to these um analog pins a1 and a2 so if we're in transmit what we're going to do is the first thing we're going to do is we're going to switch transmit group one on so what that will do is it will switch all the rf switching relays to transmit mode and the second thing it will do is it will switch all the receive modules off so all the receive modules that need um, 12 volts on on receive will be switched off and then we're gonna have a tiny delay just 100 milliseconds and you can tweak that again depending on what you want and then we're going to switch transmit group 2 on. Now this is the mic amp, the transmit IF amps, post mixer amp, the driver and the PA. So this is basically all the transmit modules that need 12 volts on transmit. We're going to switch them on. So the, the beauty of this is that you can make sure that all your relays are switched and all your 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 receive stuff is off before you start pumping rf through the uh through the transmit stage and even that just a short delay you know make sure that that everything is in place first and that i found that to be quite a, a, a useful thing we're also going to read um pin five and which will detect whether the tuning tone switch is on and if it is, then we're going to call tuning tone and the tuning tone indicator. The tuning tone indicator just puts a T over the um, the the red dot, and uh, and of course it's it's a green dot when we're on receive and a red dot when we're on on transmit. But a T over it is when we're in tuning. And then the tuning tone is very simple. That just creates a a, a, a square wave. Right, okay, so that's transmit. So what about on receive? Well, on receive, basically, we're undoing all the stuff that we've just done on transmit. Um, so we're killing any tuning tone, because we don't want any tuning tones on receive. Um, we're turning the transmit indicator off, so that will turn it back to green. And we're going to switch transmit group to off, so all those transmit modules will have the power killed to them. And we're going to wait and then i mean only 100 milliseconds but you know <laughs> and then we're going to switch transmit group one off so that means the rf switching relays will all switch back into receive mode which is the default mode and the receive 12 volt modules will be switched on so that's the rf preamp the receive if amps and the audio amps will all get some power so what we're doing is we're making sure that all the transmit stuff is completely switched off before we we one switch the relays and then switch on all the the receive stuff uh, as i said and again I, it just seems pretty good housekeeping really and there's some timing stuff.
Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that is pretty much it. I will just show you the S meter. Yes, now, I apologise to whoever wrote this S meter code because I, I can't honestly remember where I've pinched it from now, but I did pinch it from somebody, so apologies for that. Um, and I butchered it, so apologies for that as well. Um, and uh, But, yes, this, this is what I use. I think I use something very similar to it. A while ago now, a few years ago now, when I built that um, SDR, and essentially all it does, and you'll remember, we've got a little uh, a kind of rectifier diode there, and uh, that the, before it goes into this um, uh, S meter reading pin, and and we're reading just an analog voltage on the pin, and we're doing some calculations and coming up with some um, uh, S units and uh, and then we're displaying those in our S meter uh, and effectively what we do it looks like little blocks of, of colour so they're S5 and upwards is green and then once you get to S9 and S9 plus it goes red um, but actually I'm not I'm just displaying blocks rectangles but because I'm uh, I've got a kind of grid uh, a black grid which I'm superimposing over those rectangles it looks like blocks that are increasing so it's a clever little um, uh, a trick really to, to doing these kind of blocks that go up and down it, it's really just rectangles increasing in size um, with with little kind of uh, invisible because they're black on a black screen grids that are placed over them and I think that is pretty much it um, so uh, as I said I will link to uh, this code below so you can um, have a play around with it uh, what I'll also link to are some of the libraries that might not be so easy to find so um, anyway I hope that was of some help as I said I am nothing like a coding ninja it's not optimized you know and probably you could look at this and uh, think well I could do that a lot better well please do <laughs> please do have fun and um, and, uh, and and see what you can create with it yourself um, but if this is any use to anybody then um, uh, that's great well I hope that was of some interest and apologies if you're not into all this software stuff um, because uh, the next video we're going to be uh, moving uh, back into the hardware realm and uh, I, th <laughs> I think Bill uh, N2CQR thinks I've gone over to the dark side uh, <laughs> all this digital stuff so um, so to him and everybody else let me just put your mind at rest uh, the next video we are going to be uh, solidly back in uh, analog hardware because we're going to be uh, rolling our own double balance diode ring mixers for this um, uh, radio that I'm building behind me. So that's next time. Until then, look after yourselves. Thanks very much for watching 73. Bye-bye.